जब तेरा नूर आया जाता रहा अंधेरा ये सो गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई वुड लाइक टू स्टार्ट ऑफ बाय थैंकिंग यू ऑल फॉर कमिंग फॉर जॉइनिंग अस हियर टुडे फॉर पीस सिंपोजियम 2016 in the speech for the opening ceremony for this academic year professor Juanito Camilleri spoke about change that as time goes by things necessarily change and that change should in turn foster growth and innovation however he quipped that change can also be destructive more so if it is based on prejudice intolerance fear or hatred At present Europe is facing what is known as the migration crisis with over a million migrants and refugees crossing into Europe in 2015 according to the BBC. This has sparked a crisis as countries are struggling to, clo- to cope with the influx and a division has been created in the EU over how best to deal with resettling people. It has not just been a matter of money but rather a matter of whether Europeans are willing to open their communities and live peacefully side by side with other minority groups that practice a different kind of lifestyle, religion, traditions. What has this meant for our tiny little gem Malta? Up to a few decades ago, towns and villages in Malta were so tightly knit, it was normal to leave the front door unlocked, to know every t- every little thing about everyone living in the nearest radius, knowing them by their laam, including what their medical history is, the latest scandal and gossip in town. There was a sense of familiarity, traditions, and to an extent, the feeling of being safe in your community. Fast forward to 2016 and this feeling has faded. Yet the mistake that some people make is that they have misplaced the sense of community and replaced it with ra- racism, intolerance, xeno- and xenophobia as our communities grew and became more varied. We are living in a society which judges a person by religion or skin color. It is simply disgusting that our news this very same week featured the story of a Fr- French black citizen living in Malta who was verbally and physically abused together with his Maltese girlfriend because of his skin color. Our Christian values teach us tolerance, acceptance, values of kindness and sharing, peace and love. Yet is our society truly practicing such values when we constantly segregate people in a them versus us mentality? when we insult a girl wearing a hijab when we automatically assume that muslim equals isis i'm not about to go on some rant because i am far from the ideal practicing christian at times yet i would like to believe that as a community we could work together for, towards peace and tolerance it is possible to have different kinds of people from all walks of life living side by side peacefully even in a 316 square kilometer island despite the different religions backgrounds nationalities race i believe that one contributing factor is fear we fear what we do not know we fear that which is different to us which brings us to today's peace symposium an opportunity for us students to ask questions and get to know more about sharia i must say in my head the term doesn't have many positive connotations without having conducted any research on the topic i would have associated sharia with lack of women's rights and respect but i am here today because i want to learn more about the subject i want to remove all the prejudice i may have related to the subject once you have the right information about something it stops being scary or foreign I thank Ahmadiyya Muslim Ahmad for approaching KSU to work together to organize this year's peace symposium. I'm sure that they are here and they will be very happy to answer any questions that you may have on this topic today. Thank you. Okay, so before having um Lai like Ahmad Atif and Ayaz Mahmoud Khan to Uh, give their give their um, uh, presentations um, as i said i'm i'm on the receiving end of this of this experience i want it to be an experience i want to understand um, uh, sharia i want to understand its relation to human rights i'm interested in how this phenomenon and how this um, uh, practice uh, impinges on on the community and as 
Becky said very well, my understanding of Sharia is very negative. I very much doubt if, if I will go out of this hall um, with, a, with a different opinion, but I'm obviously ready and open to, to listen. What I'm a bit concerned about is that such symposia and such initiatives attract people who are interested in engaging in community, interested in, in trying to connect. Um, obviously, this is an assumption because I don't know everyone, um, but um, it would have been uh, very interesting to see people who are resistant to, to change, resistant to multiculturalism, resistant to um, having <laughs> communities that are encapsulating uh, to be present for this symposium. It would have probably given a lot of richness to this experience as well. What I think is happening, but um, um, very much as a, a lay person, the way I see it as a lay person, is that um, our communities are failing in terms of of managing to live together. We've seen this, we're seeing this in a number of, of situations. We're not seeing this just in this particular context. We're also seeing uh, it in the news when you hear about a 71-year-old man who's, who's um, been dead for two months, who lives in a, in a small street. He is closely engaged with the community. He is usually closely engaged with the community. And yet it takes more than two years, two months, for somebody to notice that he is dead. So that is something that is intrinsically uh, complex that we need to try to understand. And obviously I'm looking forward to this experience to see how I can understand this part of, of um, our, uh, our community. So I leave it up to uh, uh, Ahmed Atif, to the president of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community to give us um, an expose of Islamic <laughs> Sharia and human rights. Uh, in the name of Allah, the gracious, ever merciful, respected chairman, President KSU, uh, distinguished scholars, guests, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. I'm very delighted to share some thoughts uh, with you today on the subject of Islamic Sharia and human rights. The matter of human rights is a very fundamental and important subject. While it is essential that human rights should be safeguarded through executive, administrative, legislative and judicial processes, it also requires that we all individually and collectively strive continuously to deepen our consciousness of the duties we owe to each other at the moral and spiritual level. For the Muslims and indeed for all mankind, Islam seeks to stimulate and deepen that consciousness. It emphasizes our duties and obligations so that each of us by due discharge of them should help to safeguard freedom, justice and equality for all and should promote and foster human welfare and prosperity in all spheres, social, economic, moral and spiritual. It seeks to establish a pattern of society which in all the changing and developing circumstances of a dynamic world would maintain its character of beneficence in all spheres of life, individual, domestic, national, and international. For this purpose, it furnishes us with a framework of beliefs, duties, obligations, and sanctions. It also provides us with guidance at all levels and in all fields. The edifice and the whole superstructure of Islamic faith is predicated on one cardinal principle, the principle of the unity of the creator and the unity and equality of mankind. Islam has established a universal brotherhood and universal human rights, similar and equal for the entire mankind without any discrimination or any privilege. The Holy Quran states, O mankind, we have created you from a male and a female, and we have made you into tribes and sub-tribes that you may recognize one another. Verily, the most honorable among you in the sight of God is he who is the most righteous among you. 
This verse alone champions the entire structure of human rights. There can be no human rights without equality, justice, and racial harmony. The fundamental human rights can be divided into two basic categories, the general rights and the particular rights. Some of the general rights include the right to life and security of a person, protection of honor, personal freedom, equality, freedom of conscience, freedom of thought and expression, basic survival needs, freedom of work, justice, education, health, and the right to have a family. Some of the particular rights include the rights of women, children, parents, the mutual rights of husband and wife, the rights of orphans, relatives, neighbors, sick and dis disabled, the right of guests, hosts, prisoners of war, laborers, and minorities. Islam recognizes all these rights. Due to the limitation of time, I cannot discuss all the above mentioned in detail, and I can only present to you a brief summary of some of these rights. The first and foremost of these is the right of life. In fact, according to, the, according to Islam, every form of life is sacrosanct and cannot be taken without justification. Even unnecessarily killing of animals or destroying other kinds of life is forbidden in Islam. But human life is specially sacrosanct. In the Holy Quran, God Almighty says, whosoever killed a person, unless it be for killing a person or for creating disorder in the land, it shall be as if he had killed all mankind. Further, in chapter 17, suicide and infanticide are particularly condemned. Anyone committing suicide or inciting others to become suicide bombers is in fact committing a grievous sin and humiliating the teachings of Islam. Islam also laid great emphasis on the right of independent life and rejects the notion of slavery. From the very beginning, the Holy Prophet of Islam looked at the slavery and slave trade with distaste and abhorrence, and he took the strongest measures to eliminate this loathsome practice. The Holy Quran is filled with injunctions about the abhorrence of slavery and the rights of prisoners of war, needy and poor. It states, do you know what is the rights? It is the freeing of a slave or feeding in a day of hunger an orphan near of kin or a poor, may, or a poor man lying in the dust. These verses speak of two methods to raise the spiritual and moral stature of a person. Freeing the slaves, freeing the slaves, that is to say, rising, uh, raising the suppressed, oppressed, and depressed section of the community to an equal partnership in life. Helping the orphans and the poor to stand on their own feet and to become useful members of the community. Islam gives to all the right of freedom of conscience. Giving this right means that everyone is free to profess, practice, and preach any faith religion, opinion, or doctrine he or she holds to be true and declares that there is no compulsion in religion. Furthermore, there is no worldly punishment is prescribed for the apostasy and the blasphemy in the Holy Quran. Next, in importance to the right of life and freedom is the right to basic human needs. Hence, the first teachings with regard to civic society, which according to the Holy Quran were given to Adam, were, it states, It is provided for thee that thou wilt not hunger therein, nor wilt thou be naked, and that thou wilt not thirst therein, nor wilt thou be exposed to the sun. That is, to have food, water, clothing, and shelter, the basic necessities of life, are the rights of every individual. It is the individual duty of each and every person and collective duty of a government and society as well, as well as the world at large that no human being remains hungry or thirsty or without sufficient clothing and reasonable shelter. Islam gives these rights to every human being. Moreover, Islam also believes in the right of each human being that he or she should be given means and opportunities of development of physical, intellectual, moral, and spiritual faculties to the full. Islam also highlights the importance of right to work 
and the employment. In work as well as in reward for work, Islam condemns all kinds of exploitation and discrimination on the basis of gender, race, nationality, or religion. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that the wages of a laborer must be paid to him before the sweat dries upon his body. With regards to the rights of servants, the Prophet said, They are your brothers and you should treat them as such. Provide them with the kind of clothes that you wear and if you set them a hard task, join them in it to help them complete it. Islam also believes in the right of human dignity and honor and says, O oh, ye who believe, let not one people deride one another who may be better than they, nor let women deride other women who may be better than they and defame not your own people. Islam also lays great stress on the rights of neighbors. The concept of neighborhood in Islam is a very wide concept which covers all possible neighborly situations and is not confined to the ordinary concept of neighborhood. Thus in chapter 4 verse 37 of the Holy Quran God says and show kindness to and show kindness to parents and to the kindred and orphans and the needy and to the neighbor that is a kinsman and the neighbor that is a stranger and the companion by your side and the wayfarer. This verse describes the following neighborly relations. The neighbor that is a kinsman, the neighbor that lives near, the neighbor that is kindly, the neighbor that is a stranger, the neighbor that lives at a distance, the neighbor that is not kindly, the next door neighbor, the companion by, by your side, for example, your colleague or fellow student, the colleague in general and fellow partners in trade, the companion on a journey, the tenant who sh the tenants who share your house. The Holy Quran says that all these various kinds of neighbors have the right to be treated not only with justice, but also with kindness. The Holy Prophet is reported that he said, one whose neighbor is not safe at his hands shall not enter paradise. Islam also looks after the rights of parents and the children comprehensively. God very strongly admonishes children to treat their parents not only with justice but also with benevolence. Holy Quran says, show kindness to parents if one of them or both of them attain old age with you. Never say unto them any word expressive of disgust nor reproach them but address them with kind words. Apart from the parents' rights over their children, the Holy Quran also clearly mentions the rights of the children upon their parents. It declares, Do not murder your children for the fear of lack of food. It is we who provide for you and for them as well. The word murder does not imply physical murder. It is a metaphorical expression meaning, among other things, that you should, you should not bring them up in a manner which is equivalent to their spiritual, intellectual, and economical murder. That is to say, it is a right of children to be given proper upbringing, including good health and standard education. Further, the Holy Quran makes it compulsory upon parents not to give preferential treatment to some of their children over others and always do justice between them. The Holy Prophet, admonished to treat one's children with respect, respect. Regarding the proper upbringing of daughters, the Holy Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, a person who brings his daughter up well and gives her a good training and education thereby earns paradise. The rights of orphans are also emphasized repeatedly in the Holy Quran and it lays this responsibility on the entire society and takes special care of the rights of orphan children. The Holy Quran says, and he enjoins you to observe equality towards orphans and whatever good you do, surely Allah knows it well. And they ask you concerning the orphans, say, promotion of their welfare is an act of good, as an act of great goodness. And if you intermix with them, they are your brethren. As far as the rights of women are concerned, Islam was the first religion to formally grant the women a status never known before. In Islam, husband and wife have mutual rights such as the right to inheritance, the right 
to property, the mutual right of divorce, the right that both parents have a say in matters concerning the upbringing of children, the wife's right that she should be maintain, maintained by her husband, irrespective of whether or not she has her own independent means or income. Honor killing, forced marriages, female genital mutilation, domestic violence against women are all barbaric and un-Islamic. Un it is true that we also find these unlawful practices in some Muslim societies. However, Islam has nothing to do with these practices. These are the result of tribal or sometimes uh, historic legacy issues, culture or customs and false sense of pride. Islam rewarded women, women the same spiritual capacity as men and that she can attain equal spiritual reward by her own efforts the Holy Quran says, whoso, whoso acts righteously, whether male or female, and is a believer, such shall enter heaven. They will be provided therein without myers. Islam also lays down the principle of equality for women and men to seek knowledge. The Holy Prophet said, seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave, and that it is the duty of every Muslim man and Muslim, every Muslim woman to acquire knowledge. Islam has been foremost in assigning to women a position of economic independence. Any property that a woman might acquire by her own effort or might inherit as an, as an heir or receive as a legacy or gift belongs to her independently. Islam has also granted women the right to inherit. The Holy Quran admonishes Muslim men to treat their wives well. It says, consort with your wives in kindness, and if you dislike them, it may be that you dislike a thing wherein Allah has placed much good. And they, the women, have rights similar and equal to those of men, over them in equity. The Holy Prophet is reported said, the best of you are those who behave best towards their wives. I shall conclude with a quote from the last address famed in the history of, as the farewell address of the Holy Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, which is an epitome and essence of the entire Islamic teachings and spirit of Islam. It shows how deep was the Prophet's concern for the welfare of mankind and the peace of the world. Also, how deep was his regard for the rights of women and other creatures and other segments of the society. The Prophet stood before a large gathering of Muslims and said, I quote, O people, your lives and your possessions have been made immune by God to attacks by one another until the day of judgment. God has appointed for everyone a share in the inheritance. O men, you have some rights against your wives, but your wives also have some rights against you. Your duty is to provide for them food and garments and shelter according to your own standard of living. Remember, you must always treat your wives well. God has charged you with the duty of looking after them. O oh, men, you still have in your possession some prisoners of war. I advise you, therefore, to feed them and to clothe them in the same way and style as you feed and clothe yourself. If they do anything, if they do anything wrong which you are unable to forgive, then pass them on to someone else. They are part of God's creation to give them pain or trouble. To give them pain or trouble can never be right. O oh men, what I say to you, you must hear and remember, all of you are equal. All men, whatever nation or tribe they may belong to and whatever, whatever station in life they may hold are equal. Even as the fingers of the two hands are equal, so are human beings equal to one another. No one has any right, any superiority to claim over another. You are as brothers. God has made the lives, property and honor of every human being sacred. To take any man's life or his property or attack his honor is unjust and wrong. What I command you today is not meant only for today, it is meant for all time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
Thank you very much. A lot to ponder on and to discuss. I'm sure we'll be having um, quite some time to discuss and to engage with our speakers. I'd like to invite Ayas Mahmoud Khan for his presentation. I'm pretty sure I said his name wrongly, so um, maybe he'll tell us exactly how it should be pronounced. Thank you very much. You've done a very good job at pronouncing my name, and for that you deserve credit. <laughs> Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon all you, uh, Andrew, um, and I'm sorry, Rebecca. Rebecca, thank you very much for sharing this event. Uh, thank you to all of the guests who have come out today to uh, engage in this, uh, uh, this program and have a discussion. It's wonderful uh, to see uh, when people of different backgrounds can come together and discuss things of mutual importance in a uh, harmonious and loving atmosphere. And that is exactly what we intend to do today. Um, my colleague, uh, Mr. Atif, has spoken on the importance of human rights in uh, Islam. And I will be speaking on uh, Sharia and state. I would readily accept that when we hear the word Sharia in today's climate, in today's environment, uh, the word Sharia and the word state uh, often bring forth images of violence, oppression, tyranny. Uh, we see images on the media where people are ruthlessly and barbarically lined up and shot and executed. We hear about women who are raped. We hear about innocent girls who are barred from attaining an education. And we hear about ISIS. These are the images which often come to mind when we think, when we hear the word Sharia. I would accept that most definitely. But the question is, is that exactly what Sharia teaches? Although those are the images which come to mind when we hear the word Sharia, what requires further investigation is whether the Sharia actually teaches the atrocities that we see in the media on the news. And I would very... I would readily accept that these are the images that come to mind when we hear these words, but I would also respectfully state that these atrocities have absolutely nothing to do with Islam. They have nothing to do with what real Sharia stands for. When we talk about Sharia and when we talk about state, seeing as this is often a very controversial topic, I would, like to, and I would like to start off by making a statement which perhaps would seem very shocking to each and every one of the people sat in this room. And that is that true Sharia is far from what ISIS practices and shows and demonstrates. True Islamic Sharia, if it is practiced in the way that it is to be practiced, is such that in a truly Islamic state, a non-Muslim can be the head of state. How is that possible? It's possible because a truly Islamic state is not a state of compulsion or coercion. It is not a state where people are forced to abandon their religions and accept Islam or uh, face execution and death. True Islamic Sharia, if practiced in its essence and in its spirit, is actually a secular state. And what is the meaning of a secular state? We all live in secular states now, where democracy is prevalent, where the rule of law is prevalent, where justice is administered. Secularism, in the true sense of the word, means that justice should prevail in every circumstance. And everyone who is a citizen of a certain state should have the right to an equal level of equality, irrespective of his or her background, their gender, their race, their religious desires and their religious uh, uh, subscriptions and their religious attachments, irrespective of all these different factors, in a truly secular state, everyone has an equal right to justice. And this is what democracy stands for. 
This is what the modern day society stands for, for liberation, for freedom. And that is exactly the meaning of a true Islamic state. So what I can say at the very outset is that in order for us to understand what Sharia is and what relationship Sharia has with state, we must understand at the very outset that just because a group of people in the Middle East or in somewhere else in the, in the world say that they are practicing these atrocities that they commit in the name of Sharia, that does not make it Sharia. If a person tomorrow uh, got up and uh, started a dictatorship, for example, and began to usurp the rights of law-abiding citizens, and if that person said that I'm doing this in the name of democracy, we would not take it for the face value just because that person says he is doing what he is doing in the name of democracy. What we would do as intelligent uh, citizens, as people with our own abilities to reason and our own faculties of uh, reasoning and uh, judgment, we would first look at the definition of democracy and the principles of democracy. And then we would judge that individual on the basis of those principles and see whether he is actually truthful in what he says. So too, in the Middle East, when extremist molvis and clergymen rape women, execute innocent people, debar children from attaining an education, and commit atrocities in the name of Islam, before we attribute those things to Islam, it is our duty as intellectual beings with faculties of reason to find out the definition of the Sharia. And when we know the principles of the Sharia and when we learn about the principles of Islam, only then will we be, will we be in a position to determine whether those actions by these extremist clergymen in the Middle East and the actions of ISIS, for example, whether they accord with the principles of the Sharia. And that is basically, at the very outset, something that I would like to put forth before my guests. Now, when we talk about, so at the outset, what I would say is that just because an extremist Molvi in the Middle East kills innocent people in the name of Sharia, that does not make it Sharia. That makes it an injustice of that individual person. The religion of Islam today has been hijacked by people who have nothing else in their agenda but their own personal gain. And today, what I will do in the brief time which I have is speak about some of the principles that the Sharia stands for and give examples of uh, what uh, the Sharia is. Firstly and foremost, we must take into account, as I mentioned, the definition of Sharia. Sharia very simply means a path a way, a set of principles. And the principles of Islam, which uh, the Sharia teach, are based, once again, I will reiterate this throughout my talk, the principles of Sharia are not based on the actions of extremists, people who call themselves clergy, who call themselves Muslims, but do everything which is against the Holy Quran. The principles of the Sharia are not judged by the actions of extremists. They are judged by the Holy Qur'an. The Holy Qur'an is a book which, as all Muslims believe, to be the Word of God and the Divine Scripture. And all of the principles of the Sharia are based on the teachings of the Holy Qur'an. After that, we believe that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the founder of Islam, was the man upon which this Holy Qur'an was revealed. So he was the very first person who knew the meaning of that book which was revealed upon him. And his practice and his actions gave a physical expression to the words of God. So if we want to understand what the Sharia stands for, what the principles of the Sharia are, there are two sources which we must go to. Number one, the Holy Qur'an which is the book of Allah, and number two, the actions of the holy founder of Islam, the holy prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And when we look at these two sources, 
we will find that Islam is a religion which stands for peace, not terrorism. The very meaning of the word Islam is peace. Islam is an Arabic word which is derived from the Arabic root word salama. And salama means peace and submission. And peace and submission can never give birth to terrorism. It can never give birth to atrocities against humanity. So anything or any action which is against the teachings of peace or which are against an environment which is conducive to peace is un-Islamic from the very outset. Then, when we look at the relationship of the Sharia and state, we have various sources that we can return to. Number one, as I mentioned, the teachings and principles taught in the Holy Quran. And number two, as I mentioned, the actions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the founder of Islam, and then the four caliphs who came after him, who we also believe as Muslims to be divinely appointed Khalifas. As a Muslim, it is my duty to speak on behalf and defend those actions of the Holy Prophet of Islam. I, I, I as a Muslim, it is my duty to, if an objection comes forth, I am to respond to those objections and explain those objections if they are against the Holy Quran, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or the Khalifas. It is not my duty as a Muslim to speak for and vouch for the actions of extremists in the Middle East. Because as I have mentioned from the very outset, if that is Sharia, which ISIS teaches, then I as a Muslim am the first to condemn those actions. Because those actions hurt me more than anyone else. Because it is I who call myself a Muslim. And if atrocities are committed in the name of a religion which I abide by, then it hurts me more than anyone else. So as far as those actions are concerned, I condemn them. But I would very respectfully state that the Qur'an, nowhere does it teach injustice and violence and oppression. The Holy Prophet of Islam lived a beautiful life. He was a prince of peace. He never sought to create disorder. He never compelled anyone to become Muslim. He never taught violence and oppression. And so too his Khalifas also did the same. They never taught violence and oppression. They liberated people. They gave people the right to abide by their own beliefs and their religions. And you may say that everything that I am saying are mere claims. What is the proof for this? Well, history bears witness to what I am saying. In the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we can say that Sharia was practiced in its purest, utmost, pristine purity. And in the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam, we have many examples where the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, ran not only, not only was he a prophet of God, but he also served as a head of state. When he migrated to Medina, he, sorry, I'm not taking out my phone to check my text messages, I'm taking it out to see how much time I have left before anyone thinks that I'm sending messages to someone. So the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, when he migrated to Medina, he was elected as the head of state. In Medina, there was a group of Muslims who followed the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And there was also a Jewish community which lived in Medina. And there was also people who were idol worshippers as well. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, was elected as the head of state by all of these three denominations of people in Medina. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, practiced the Sharia in Medina, but never once was anyone compelled to become a Muslim. You see, often the thought which comes to mind is that if Sharia is implemented in a country, then that means that everyone must either become Muslim or be executed. This is absolutely false. The Holy Prophet of Islam, when he arrived in Medina and when he was elected as the head of state, the very first thing that he did was that he wrote out and chalked out the Charter of Medina, which is still recorded in books of history, which contain 10 to 15 points. 
And in that charter of Medina, which was mutually agreed upon by the Muslims and the, Christ and the Jewish people and the uh, pagan idolaters in Medina, it was decided that all people would have the right to have a secure life. All people, irrespective of their religion, would have the right to practice their religion without any compulsion whatsoever. And if an attack was made upon the Jewish community from a foreign threat, or if an attack was launched against the pagan idolaters by a foreign threat, the Muslims and all of the communities in Medina would come together to defend those people. Because those people, before they were Jews, before they were idolaters, and before they were Muslims, they were all citizens of the same state. And that is the peaceful teaching which Islam teaches. That before our religious differences come our citizenship. And that is the teaching of Islam. That all people, when they live in a state, they are citizens of that country. And they have the right to life. They have the right to freedom of conscience. They have the right to live in peace and harmony. And Islam is a religion which teaches that and stands by that. You see in the Holy Quran, where Allah the Almighty speaks about defense, the Holy Quran says that it is the right of Muslims to defend churches if they are attacked. It is the duty of Muslims to defend synagogues if they are attacked. And then in the very end, in that verse of the Holy Quran, it states that if mosques are attacked, then Muslims are per permitted to defend themselves and defend those mosques. But this verse of the Holy Quran very beautifully first states churches, then synagogues, then other places of worship, and then at the end mosques are mentioned. Which shows that the teachings of universal harmony which Islam teaches are so beautiful that in order for me to be a true Muslim, if a church is attacked, if someone seeks to create disorder in a Christian community, it is my duty as a Muslim to stand up for those rights of those Christians. What to talk of killing Christians and executing people of other faiths? This is something which has nothing to do with the religion of Islam. And this is not something that I am stating of my own self. These are things which are written in the Holy Quran. So what more can I say other than the fact that a extremist Malvi in the Middle East who covers up these facts and says that the Quran teaches violence all I can say is that he lies. The Quran does not say any of these things. That's all I can say. And I can try my best to remove these misconceptions, which is why we are here today. Then, when we talk about the example of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, once again, let's talk about practicalities. Theory is well and good, but let's see how Islam was actually practiced by the founder of Islam. That's the only way that we will know the fruits of Islam. As Jesus said, a tree is known by its fruits. So too, if we are to find out what Islam teaches, we must see the practical implementation of Islam. And the best form of Islam when it was implemented was in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So I've given one example of the Charter of Medina to show how Islam stands for equality. There is another very beautiful example. Once... Uh, a group of Christians came from Najran to visit the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and have a discussion on various religious matters. And they came to visit the Holy Prophet in Medina, and uh, they were sitting in the mosque when the time for prayer came. And the Christian delegation stood up and asked the messenger of Islam if they could be given permission to leave the mosque to offer their worship. <coughs> when they got up... <coughs> The Holy Prophet of Islam said to those Christians that, Oh my dear brothers, this is also a house of God. You are permitted to offer your worship in my mosque. And the Christians were very surprised. They said that we have no problem in stepping outside of the mosque to offer our form of worship because you face the Kaaba and we face in the other direction. So we do not want to do anything which would hurt your feelings. And the Holy Prophet of Islam said, absolutely not. You are most welcome to offer your worship in my mosque. And he permitted those Christians came from a place called Najran. And they offered their worship in the Holy Prophet's mosque. 
Now these are the examples of a true Islamic state. This is an example of true Sharia practiced in its pristine purity, where respect and honor is given to people of different faiths. Then there is a very beautiful example of uh, the second Khalifa of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. <clears throat> it so happened once that he was in Jerusalem and the time for prayer came and he was in one of the largest churches in Jerusalem. And when the time for prayer came, the bishop said to Umar, peace be upon him, the Khalifa, the second Khalifa, that, O oh, Khalifa, you can offer your prayers here if you wish. And Hazrat Umar, the second Khalifa of Islam, he responded to the bishop by saying that, O oh, noble bishop, thank you very much for your offer, but I would prefer to go outside of the church and offer my prayers on the steps outside because I fear that today I am the leader of the Muslims, I am the Khalifa. If I offer my prayers in the church, I fear that I may not be able to safeguard your rights because after my demise, it is possible that the Muslims may think that this church is also a part of their mosque and they may annex this church with the mosque. So it is my desire that in order to keep your rights fully safeguarded and so that no one should fall victim to the misunderstanding that this church is also a part of our mosque, I would prefer to offer my prayers outside so that I can safeguard your rights. These are the examples of the Khalifas of Islam. These are the examples of the Sharia of Islam when it is practiced in its pristine purity. Then there are so many other examples. One question which often comes to mind when we talk about the relationship between Sharia and state is that wherever there is a majority of Muslims, they have the right to implement the law of Sharia and all other people of different faiths are to follow that law whether they agree with it or not. This is also a grave misunderstanding. And the Holy Quran simply does not teach this. Because the Holy Quran says, as I mentioned, the Sharia is based on the Holy Quran. And the Holy Quran says, La ikraha fid deen, which means there is no compulsion in religion. Which means that the Sharia, even though there is a majority of Muslims in a certain country, a, a majority of Muslims do not have the right to forcefully implement the Sharia in any country which is against the will of people of other faiths. That's very simple. In fact, even in a majority Muslim country where there are different denominations of Muslims, the Sharia cannot be forcefully implemented there either. Because, for example, in all religions, there are different sects who have a different understanding of the religious texts. Catholics have a different view than the Protestants. So too, the, the Shias have a different view than the Sunnis. And if there is a group of Sunnis, for example, which have a 40% uh, population, and there is a 40% population of Shias and a 20% population of Christians in other faiths, what right does the Sunni denomination have to impose their interpretation of the Sharia on those who have a different interpretation? So, what that means is that the Sharia, or the law of the Holy Quran, cannot be implemented by force in any country. The Holy Quran, as I mentioned in the very outset of my speech, was that Islam, the true concept of an Islamic state is, and Andrew, I have five minutes before you start getting nervous again. <laughs> um, so the real concept of Sharia, if it is to be followed, is that justice should prevail. I mentioned at the very outset that a truly Islamic state is a secular state. And secularism stands by equality. Equality for all denominations, of all people, of all religious backgrounds. So what that means is that in the Holy Quran does present various principles of justice, of equality, of freedom of conscience. If those principles of the Holy Quran are adopted by a country, and if they are ruled in, if they are elected into government through a democratic process and through legislation, with the view, in, with the opinion of all of the people of that country, then that's wonderful. 
That is Islamic Sharia. Islamic Sharia simply means to follow the teachings of justice and equality and freedom of conscience which the Holy Quran teaches. And in any country where those principles are applicable, where those principles are being followed, that is the Islamic Sharia. Islamic Sharia is not what we see in the news. As I mentioned, Islamic Sharia simply means that justice should prevail and it simply means that everyone in any country has the right to follow whatever their religious subscriptions are. And as I mentioned, these are not mere claims. The Holy Prophet of Islam, <clears throat> Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, practically did exactly what I am stating right now. And he was a head of state of a state where there was people of all religious backgrounds and every single individual had justice. <coughs> so, in the end, if I may end simply by stating, of course, we'll have more time to discuss this during the question and answer discussion period as well. But if I can say one thing and close, that is that the Islamic Sharia is a law of peace. It is a law which honors, it is a set of principles which if all humanity upholds, then Muslims and Christians and Jews and people of all other faiths will have equal rights. That is what Islam stands by. Islam stands by justice and equality. It does not stand for violence and oppression. So anything which is against these teachings of harmony and love and peace and teach oppression have nothing to do with the religion of Islam and have nothing to do with the Sharia. And if they do, then as a Muslim, I would be the first one to object to such a teaching of oppression. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, obviously now we have um, time for, for discussion from the floor. Obviously, there are some, some issues that we might uh, pick on and possibly people will be asking. For example, the issue of apostasy, the issue of decency and how that will be interpreted in terms of how women, um, uh, what women were and, and how is that uh, perceived within a society where um, uh, where, where women are allowed to wear whatever they want. How does that combine? The issue as well of um, uh, Sharia being a set of principles and how, how do these set of principles match or relate to democratic societies and how do they match to secular societies? Um, I'm also interested in possibly uh, exploring a bit more the issue also of um, of the legal system. One of the things that is associated with Sharia is that um, there are, if I'm not mistaken, there are two types of, of um, sanctioning um, uh, when it comes to the issue of, of people, for example, stealing and this issue of people having their hands chopped off or stoned, whether this is an issue and whether this is a myth or if this can happen. So assuming Malta decides that Sharia law is acceptable, would that mean that if I steal, if I'm a Muslim and I steal, would that mean that I'll get my hands chopped off? So I think if we can bring it down to, to the, to the nitty-gritties and to the daily uh, things that might, we might be um, experiencing. Sure. Can you identify who you are if you... Um, my name's Ian Baldaki, you know. I had a question. You mentioned that Muhammad, nor the four rightly guided caliphs, ever preached violence, uh, disorder, or discrimination. Um, given that, um, how would you justify the wars that were waged by Muhammad and the caliphs? And uh, secondly, when did the concept of jizzy attacks start to develop out of Sharia? So the first question is about the wars of the Prophet of Islam. I think it's very important to put into context uh, the environment in which those wars were fought. Often, the, 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 the prevalent notion which we see put forth is that uh, the Prophet of Islam waged these wars as an offensive form of, of violence in order to uh, thrust his religious ideology onto other people. And quite frankly, 
uh, the historical background of that era negates such a concept. The Prophet of Islam never waged an offensive war, or any offensive war for that matter, uh, to spread the religion of Islam. And if you permit me, I will put everything into context as far as the history is concerned. When the Prophet of Islam uh, preached his mission of Islam, when he came, as all prophets do, uh, he came as a messenger of Allah and said that God has sent me with a message to the people of Mecca. And he said that I have come to remove the oppression and the violence and the injustice and remove sin from uh, the land and I've been sent as a divinely appointed messenger. In response to that, uh, the, the Muslims were persecuted barbarically. And there are incidents written in the books of history which show that poor Muslims were literally uh, dragged in the streets of Mecca, in the scorching streets of Mecca, as r sharp stones pierced their backs. They were dragged in the streets. They were persecuted. Uh, women, uh, innocent women, were butchered mercil mercilessly by uh, the, the people of Mecca. And this continued for 13 years. For 13 years, the Prophet of Islam remained in Mecca. And this persecution was waged against him. And this is the way of Allah. This is the way the world works. Even Jesus says that uh, a prophet is very, uh, is very much less accepted by his own people. And this is natural, that whenever a prophet of God comes, he is faced with opposition. Because he comes to teach uh, religion and spirituality to a group of people who are in, immersed in sin. So the Prophet of Islam stayed in Mecca for 13 long years and bore this persecution. There is an example of a, a chieftain of Mecca who was a very large, uh, powerful chieftain. He converted to Islam and he came to the Holy Prophet of Islam once and he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, there was a time before we were Muslims, no one in Mecca even had the courage to look up at us and stare us in the eye. And now we are dragged in the streets of Mecca. Why don't you give us permission to fight back? And the Prophet of Islam responded by saying that, I have, inni umirtu bil afwi. I have been ordered to forgive. I have not been given permission to retaliate with this violence. I have not been given permission by God to show violence in response for violence. And the Holy Prophet of Islam even rebuked that person and said that you are being impatient. You should bear this difficulty for the peace of the society and for the love of God. After 13 years, the Holy Prophet of Islam, when this persecution grew, he migrated to Medina. And if you read the historical account of when the Prophet of Islam migrated, he left with a very heavy heart. Mecca was his homeland. He was born in Mecca. He loved Mecca. He spent his entire life in Mecca. But when the persecution grew to an unbearable state, he was forced to migrate. And when he migrated, it is written that he looked back at Mecca and he had tears in his eyes. And he said, Oh Mecca, Allah knows that I love you very dearly. You are my homeland. But your people have not permitted me to live here. So I must leave. When the Holy Prophet of Islam left Mecca after 13 years of persecution to live in Medina, simply to live his life in peace and worship God with a handful of believers, uh, which number no more than four or five hundred, the Meccans attacked Medina as well. And they began to wage offensive wars against the Holy Prophet of Islam. And the first war which took place was the Battle of Badr, which took place at a place called Badr. And if you look at that, at that time, Muslims were given the, permit, the permission to defend themselves. And the Muslims were only 300 in number. And the Meccans were 1,000 in number. The Muslims were ill-equipped. They barely had two horses, and the Meccans had many horses. The Meccans had warfare equipment, but the Muslims fought with sticks. They did not even have swords and shields to defend themselves. But that small group of 300 Muslims defended themselves. And if they were not given permission to defend themselves, what else were they to do? Similarly, the Battle of Uhud was also a war which was waged against the Muslims by the Meccans. They were offensive wars by the Meccans. The Muslims merely defended themselves. Then 
Even the second battle, the third battle which took place in Islamic history was also one where the Prophet of Islam defended himself. And in every single one of these wars, if you read the books of history, you will find that the Muslims were greatly outnumbered. It was always the Meccans who had many more people than the Muslims. So if the Muslims were waging an offensive war to convert people by force, History speaks against that because a group of small, a small group can never fight against a larger group. So wherever the Muslims fought wars, they were in defense for their own religious rights. They were never to force other people to convert to Islam. But unfortunately, when we speak, when we hear about the wars of the Prophet of Islam, these details are hidden or either uh, people are unaware of these details and Orientalist scholars uh, cover up these details and say, look, Muhammad waged offensive wars to kill people. But the history speaks clearly against it. To come to your second question of jizya as well, a jizya was simply a form of tax which was imposed on non-Muslims and in return, the reason, the misconception is that that tax was imposed on non-Muslims because they were not Muslim. But this was not a religious tax which was imposed on them because they didn't follow Islam. The reason that non-Muslims were taxed jizya, it was a very small percentage anyway. And that percentage was taxed to them because it freed them from offering service in the army. The Muslims, wherever a Muslim state was established, the Muslims were required to defend the country and defend the non-Muslims which lived in that country. So by taking jizya from non-Muslims, this tax exempted non-Muslims from serving in the army. That's it. And in response for taking that tax, the Muslim authorities ensured the security and peace of those non-Muslim citizens. And that is the reason why that tax was charged. And in our modern day society, we offer even, we all pay tax to the government in return for a service. And at that time as well, this tax was offered in return for protection and security and service by the Muslims. There is an example of this one state where the Muslims were and they had taken the tax of jizya in response to what I just mentioned for that purpose. But the Muslims were forced to leave that country due to various circumstances. And since the Muslims were leaving that country and they were no longer in a position to protect those people from foreign threats, they paid back all of the money that, of the jizya which they had taken from those non-Muslims. And when they handed back that tax, they said that we are giving you this tax back because now we are leaving this country and we will no longer be able to defend you. So I have yet to see an example in any modern form of government where a tax is returned to the citizens with such honesty and such beauty. So that is the example of jizya and the purpose behind jizya. Uh, yes, I, I am Anthony Borch, ex-social studies teacher, and I have made in this university a diploma in labor studies. And that is my specialization, because in another diploma I make capital and labor class. And that is my problem. It's not about religion. Religion is always the evolution of the world. This was said by Dr. Hugo Mofsomeritus, the president, Dr. Hugo Mofsomeritus, in a symposium about Orthodox, Muslim, and Catholics. And that is the point that I want. It's useless to speak about history. If you want to know history, there is a book, violence in God's name, everything. But it is important for society to have religion. And my problem is that, that uh, there was an article by Mr. Uh, Mr. Kassar White about economics, that the North is better than us. We, the Mediterranean, have religion. It's our aim. Malta was a mountain of religion. It was like Machu Picchu. And Muslims, Catholics, that is the, was the religion. And, we, and I hope, and that's the formula that of rising of Islam, has at least make a mirror that we are losing values. In fact, once when I make a paper on education, I make a research on Engelhardt. 
uh, that, uh, the periodicals in this university where the values were, were the values. It is not important for religion. It is about regional, legal, traditional, scarcity, and postmodern. It's not, and this is for we may, we may take it as a gift from God to try to bring again values. The work, the work that, for example, there is uh, American, American economist core. She was puzzled that we have IT and stuff, and there is no leisure, so they have no time to go to the church. And even here in Malta, we have 46% hearing Sunday Mass. This is something that we have to fight for, for, for human beings, because religion sometimes give us something. There is power, as I've said, but it is important to see about that. that the example for America, Mr. Trump, he want to, to lower the, the income tax for, for, for these people, for the rich. That, that's I think, and as I've said, you, the whole, the whole, speak about this. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would like to draw the discussion back to what is presumably the subject of the symposium, and that is Sharia and state, the relationship between religion and state. Now, two of the most powerful countries in the Islamic world today, which are Saudi Arabia and Iran, are both theocratic states, which means that the sacred laws, which is Sharia, they govern everyday life. And now these two countries have the worst image possible of any Muslim country, the greatest number of executions, many of them public, denial of rights to various sections of the population. So what I've, I'm not sure exactly what the speakers have been uh, propagating, but this means that the relationship between the religion and the state is detrimental to the citizens of the state. And I think the Sharia should not form the basis of, you know, basically the constitution is just the Sharia. And I think that is wrong. It, the, the religion and the state, civil law, you could say, they should be separate even in Islamic countries. And uh, the religious laws shouldn't, or the sacred laws, which are immutable, you know, they can't be changed. They can't be replaced with man-made laws. I, I agree with you 100%, so, uh, and exactly, that is exactly what I meant when I said that Islamic law or Islamic State is actually a secular law. For example, actually, if we talk of Sharia, yeah. even living in a non-Muslim country, yeah. I can fully follow the Sharia without impinging on anyone's right because Sharia is merely a set of laws I can offer my prayers, but I can worship God. But you can't do that God. in Saudi Arabia, and you well, can't do which, that in Which Iran. is exactly why I mentioned that for any Muslim country to forcefully apply the teachings of no, the Quran I mean, according what, to their exactly own interpretations the, causes your, detriment more than confusion. anything else. What, what exactly should be the relationship between religion and state? I mean, that is what you say you're going to discuss. So, so what, what in your view should be the relationship between religion and state? I mean, should this, I mean, for, should the, they be sacred laws or should there be civil laws or should there be, a, what, what do you, what do you, what do you propose? I mean, or what do you propagate? Thank you for your question. Yeah. I, I, I propose and propagate uh, exactly what I mentioned in my speech, and that is that Sharia and state are to be kept separate. And the reason they are to be kept separate is because if we are to live in a secular state, then the interpretations of the Quranic text, or any religious text for that matter, the interpretation of one group of people upon a larger society as a whole goes against the very teachings of the Holy Quran. Because the Quran says that there is no compulsion in any matter of religion. Therefore, the, the Holy Quran is definitely a valuable book of guidance when it comes to teachings of justice and principles of, uh, of equality. And if those principles are followed in any state, then that by virtue of being it 
being in itself a secular state is the teachings of Islam. Sharia discriminates against women, for example. You talk about equality, but in Sharia, the evidence of one man is equal to the evidence of two. Women. That is a misconception. It is not equal to the evidence of two. And uh, if you read, I have read the Quran. I have, if you permit. If you permit me to speak, it is only then that I can respond to your question. I seek your forgiveness, but if you ask me a question, then you must give me the opportunity to respond as well. Uh, well oh, you, so you made a statement, and I am stating that that is contrary to the facts. Let me, let me yes. give the gentleman the opportunity here yeah, to, 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 to yeah, your argument, so that he can respond to that argument. Can you do your argument so that he'll, he'll be able to respond? What I'm telling you is that you talk about quality. Now, <coughs> you look at it from the point of view of a woman. Uh, the evidence of one man is, is equal to the evidence of two women, for example. I beg to differ with uh, you. That is no, not true. I, let me finish, please. Yes, please. Go on. And then you know that uh, in Islam, they have what they call blood money, so that if you kill somebody, the heirs of the victim can forgive you by accepting some blood money, some money in return. So the amount of money that you have to give for a man is twice what you have to give for a woman or a non-Muslim. So, I mean, let's not gloss over what are the, you know, perceived, uh, what would you call, uh, unfairness to certain sections of the... Uh, I mean, that is there. The point is that we should separate religion from the state. So, okay, your religion says that, but each state, I mean, like Indonesia, Malaysia, Turkey, these are sort of uh, progressive Muslim states. They, they, they separate the rights of uh, women from, uh, you know, under a civil law or a constitutional law as against Sharia. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, I have studied the Holy Quran for seven years. I have done a degree in theology, and I would beg to differ with you that the Holy Quran does not state that the testimony of one man is equal to two of a woman, or to say that the testimony of a woman is equal to half of that of a man. In Surah An-Nur, which is the 24th chapter of the Holy Quran, you can check later after this event. I will be here. Uh, I'll be very happy to discuss this with you. That, that, well, I mentioned, I, I, so I mentioned, as far as the practical issues are concerned, I said that at the very outset of my address, and I'm sure you heard that, that the actions of Muslim countries who claim to be teaching and establishing the Sharia are not... A, 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 a final judgment. In order for us to know the Sharia, we do not judge what the Sharia is based on the actions of Saudi Arabia or any other country. We judge the Sharia based on what the Holy Quran says. And the Holy Quran says, as you mentioned, just to take a few examples, that the testimony of one woman is equal to one of a man, and that is written in chapter 24 of the Holy Quran. The verse which you are referring to is in chapter 2 of the Holy Quran, and that is specifically in financial matters. And even there, it is not written that two women must testify in order to equate to one of a man. It simply says that if a woman, taking into account the circumstances in which the Holy Quran was revealed in uh, 7th century Arabia, when women had uh, not the same amount of opportunity to be engaged in business transactions, that if one forgets, she may recourse to the assistance of another. It does not say that two women must testify in order to equate to one of a man. And in sh we can speak about this further in depth in after the program, but very clearly to respond to what you said, uh, that is a misunderstanding on your part. I have read the Quran and I know what the Quran says. It says very clearly that one testimony of a woman is equal to one of a man. What about um, when, when there's the issue of sanctioning people's behavior? Yeah, I mean, I mean, going back to the issue of, of practical mm -hmm. pra practicalities. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, so you disassociate yourself from, um, from the fact that uh, 
punishment can be can mean people having these these drastic ways of being punished? I think, as I mentioned, that in order for any true Islamic Sharia to be practiced, or any uh, any real uh, possibility of living a life of peace and harmony, we can definitely benefit from the teachings of the Holy Quran, which teach justice and equality. But no penal code, no aspect of any of the Islamic teachings can be imposed on a group of people without their desire to adhere to those laws. So when you talk about the chopping of hands, for example, if there is a Muslim in a Muslim country and he steals, would his hands be cut off? No, they shouldn't be. And if Saudi Arabia does that, then they do so without the permission of the Holy Quran. Because when we talk about the Islamic penal code, before the Islamic penal code can be applied in any country, we must first bring up the moral standards of that country. When a prophet, when we talk about Sharia, we talk about a religious law. And as I mentioned, religious law cannot be applied by force on anyone, not on a non-Muslim and not even on a Muslim. So when we talk about the Islamic penal code in particular, whether it be for theft or whether it be for other crimes, for murder, for example, you can never forcefully apply a teaching of the Quran in a state without the democratic legislative process of that country coming into effect. If a country decides that they will uh, punish thieves with another punishment, for example, then they are free to do that, and that would be Islamic. If they decide to take another stern measure, then that would be permissible too, as long as the full legislative democratic process is taken into account. And in that case, the law would not be applicable in that state by virtue of it being an Islamic law taught by the Holy Quran. It would be applicable by virtue of it being elected in through a democratic process. And that is what Islam teaches, and that is uh, the teachings which we So if I'm understanding say. you well, if, if there's an agreement, a democratic process where women can be stoned, then it's fine? Well, absolutely. Well, I, I well, well I'm not in, being cynical. I'm no, no, uh, thank you very much for that question. Absolutely not, because so so well, I, I think all of us, irrespective of which religion we come, through, come from, would agree that that is absolutely atrocious. And as a Muslim, I agree for the same. Thank you very much, first of all, to the re representatives of the Ahmadiyya community, uh, people with considerable goodwill. Two points, if the chairman will permit. Um, one is more of a question perhaps than a point, but the very first one relates to the Ahmadiyya community itself. Um, you here in Malta, uh, and, and represented also, well represented in other countries of the West, and you freely talking to us, and, and very, we're very appreciative about what you believe in. And yet, in Bangladesh, Pakistan, in Saudi Arabia, and even in relatively tolerant Muslim countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Palestine Authority-controlled areas, Ahmadis like yourselves are systematically persecuted and killed in the hundreds. Indeed, Pakistan has gone as far as to officially declare that Ahmadis are not Muslims, are non-Muslims. This is official Pakistani policy. First, this, the first part, I, if you would, both, either of you uh, care to comment about that. And the second point is a more general one and relates to the topic that we are here to uh, discuss today. And uh, the question of Sharia. The European Court of Human Rights is very specific about Sharia in several of its sentences. It says in, on July 31st, 2001, and I quote, the institution of Sharia law is incompatible with the requirements of a democratic society. And in more detail, in, on February 13, 2003, it says that a Sharia-based regime was incompatible with the convention, the convention being the European Convention on Human Rights, in particular as regards the rules of criminal law and procedure, 
the place given to women in the legal order and its interference in all spheres of private and public life in according with religious precepts. Uh, I am not an authority on law, but this is the European Court of Human Rights uh, dictamen, um, sentence or, or declarations. So perhaps you'd care to comment on the first one concerning, because after all, one must keep in mind and, and, and the members of the public here must keep in mind that regret, regrettably, I would suggest, the 10 to 20 million Ahmadis in the world are but a, but a drop in the ocean of 1.6 billion Muslims. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you are correct in that uh, we are uh, persecuted uh, as a community in various countries. And... Um, Yes, in, in various Muslim countries, thank you for pointing that out, absolutely. Um, and you will find that in all of those countries, our response is nothing but peace. We never retaliate with violence, we never take revenge, we never take the law into our own hands. Uh, I have friends uh, at a very personal level who have had their relatives uh, shot at point blank merely on the basis that they are Ahmadi Muslims. Uh, I know of doctors who run clinics for the better, betterment of society at large uh, who are murdered in cold blood merely because they are spurred on by extremist ideologies and uh, th they are persecuted against in particular because of their faith. So it is very regrettable, you are right, but our response is beautiful and our response is a pure reflection of what Islam teaches. We do this because we believe that this is what the Quran teaches, that violence and oppression should never be returned with violence and oppression. And uh, we may be a drop in the ocean, but programs like these and our efforts continue. We try to teach the true teachings of the Quran. We try to convey the message of peace, which the Holy Quran teaches uh, to the best of our abilities. and it will make a difference. It is making a difference and it will continue to make a difference. If we are able to change the, the views and ideologies of people, even a, a small amount, then we have achieved our purpose. We are, we are headed in the right direction and change comes slowly. But if that change is positive, then it continues to multiply, it continues to flourish. When we come to the second aspect of your question, so we are not... Uh, uh, disappointed or uh, hopeless. We, we have firm faith that our efforts, since they are based on peace, will bring fruits, and they are bringing fruits. Um, that, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, when we talk about the, the verdict of uh, Islam and Sharia law being uh, incompatible with human rights in today's day and age, I will still come back to uh, my central theme, and that is that if the teaching, if, the sh if we are talking of that Sharia, which is a narrow-minded interpretation by a certain group of people, then that Sharia is probably incompatible with human rights. But if we understand the fact that the Sharia, all, I, I, I definitely agree that the practical implementation which we see of Sharia in different countries, even in progressive countries, do not show very fruitful results. But I would argue very respectfully that that is because the Sharia is not being applied as it is meant to be applied in those countries. And I mentioned earlier that no aspect of the religious law which is present in the Holy Quran can be applied and imposed and implemented by force in any state whatsoever. Principles which are mentioned by the Holy Quran are secularist principles. They stand for justice. The Quran stands for justice. The Quran stands for freedom of conscience. The Quran stands for freedom of religion. And if these values and if these principles are applied in any country, then that is Sharia. Sharia is not the narrow-minded interpretation of one sect of Islam which they practice in one religion, very frankly. So, although Saudi Arabia may be a chopping off hands left, right, and center, and that is very atrocious, 
That, just because they say they are doing it in the name of Sharia, does not make it a valid form of Sharia. What the Sharia is, as it is taught by the Holy Quran. And the Holy Quran, as I mentioned, teaches secularist principles as far as government is concerned. I have read the Holy Quran in great depth and studied it. And nowhere in the Holy Quran is a particular form of leadership either condoned or supported. And the reason for that is because the Holy Quran, as a book of universal guidance, leaves these decisions open to us and citizens of various countries to apply whatever laws and rules they deem fit in their particular political atmosphere. As long as those forms of leadership establish equality and justice, then the Quran accepts that. The Quran does not teach that the interpretations of a certain group of people should be imposed by force on any fragment of society, on any segment of society. Probably we'll have time for just one or two other moments. <laughs> they have to be very quick ones, so let's keep to the time, please. Sorry. Before I make this question, I, uh, io sono italiana e parlo meglio l'italiano. Comunque chiedo scusa agli uomini astanti. I beg the pardon of all the men in this place. Allora, if this is a more um, uh, intellectual curiosity than a provocative uh, question, which maybe it is in a way, I say sorry. If all human beings are equal in the eyes of God, why all messengers of God are always and only men? Does God only reveal, and I say this with much respect for everybody, does God only reveal and speak to men? And did ever the prophet Muhammad Peace be upon him. I have much respect for any kind of prophets. And me, myself, I read, I read, I read a lot of, uh, uh, of Quran because I want to know. Uh, did ever the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, forced, I put this in brackets, women ever to wear hijab or burqa or whatsoever? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I'm, I'm George Vidal Zamit. Um, I work here. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for organizing this. It's a pleasure to have you. When I meet you at book fairs, it's always a pleasure talking to you. So, and we're lucky to have you, by the way. Um, my problem is that, as the gentleman pointed out, probably your interpretation of Sharia today is not representative uh, of the Muslim world. So I'm sure that if you had to be sharing this platform with other Muslim scholars, um, you may be in a minority, but probably uh, you would not be in agreement with many of them. So this brings me to my second point. I was thinking, and some of the people pointed this out, that we were expecting perhaps a symposium that would have talked and what you have done, but to give us an idea on Sharia as a legal code. My interpretation today, or my understanding, hearing you, is that for you, Sharia is a way of life. You said it's a part. But it's a way of life, it's a philosophy. Uh, I, 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 I had the impression that we were going to make a connection with the laws of the state. And I was prepared to ask you, do you feel that the laws of Malta, because you are in Malta, serve you enough? Because you know that some of your colleagues in other countries uh, complain or claim that they need Sharia because the laws of the state where they reside does not serve them enough. So that is my first question. Secondly, you mentioned using our faculties of reason. Some people have used their faculties of reason or think that they are and concluded that there is no God. So some people do not believe in God. And you constantly make reference to uh, people have the freedom to believe whatever their religious prescription is. What if there is no... Or non-religious prescription. What if there... Exactly. Because uh, I know that um, atheists or agnostics uh, are not tolerated in, in, in some countries. Thirdly, and I'm sorry if I'm being quick perhaps. Thirdly, you said that true Islamic State, if practiced in essence, and I would underline if here, if and spirit is a secular state. 
Do you have any example of anywhere where this is the case? And on a very final note, you are deriving a legal code based on something that was transmitted, or so you believe, uh, 1,400 years ago. What if that is not catering for uh, situations that need some revision? Okay, is there a problem with that? Thank you very much. My um, name Just some quick points. Mr. Atif mentioned, for instance, the right to honor. And this is one of the main things that can be abused, the description of honor, semanticity, what it means, etc., etc. He also mentioned suicide. That is forbidden in the Quran, but it doesn't mention martyrdom. I have seen at least two Qurans published in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia with footnotes suggesting that suicide killings in the name of Islam, in the name of Jihad, etc., etc., not only are permissible, but they are very highly valued. I looked in different other Qurans as well, at least another 40 or 50 different Qurans, and I didn't find these footnotes anywhere except in the Qurans published in Saudi Arabia. But in the Qurans in published Arabia, they are repeated several times throughout the Quran in different points of emphasis. Also, you mentioned about the wars, which were defensive, but then there were the Ridda wars as well, which were not defensive. They were against apostasy wars, no? At least, at least in the Orientalist thing. The point I want to, want to make is the problem of Orientalism and Orientalist perspectives on Islam, and then the, within Islam itself, the Sunni-centric perspective, which takes over all other denominations and attempts, its hegemony is quite strong. So this is the second problem. The point we didn't do is a declaration of bias, that your interpretation of Sharia is the Ahmadiyya interpretation of Sharia, and you've focused on the principle of the Quran and the rightly guided caliphs. There's also the Hadith and the Sunnah, and then there's Iznad, and different points of Furu, etc. The four different schools differ, and then they differ regionally in the interpretation of those four different schools of Sharia, which causes the problems we are facing and the negative connotations attached to Sharia in the West and the readings of the West because of these interpretations. So, at the final analysis, it's a question of interpretation, how we interpret a text, if the Quran is polysemic, metaphorical, allegor, etc., and it's the word of God, as Muslims believe, it is value throughout history, it doesn't change, it's not, it's not mutable. So the interpretations require always more effort, ijtihad, to open the, the gates and understand different interpretations which have not yet arisen. So this is the main problem of Sharia. And I think the declaration of bias solves this problem. You made a very good point when you said that there are dictators who commit atrocities and they do it in the name of democracy. We don't could, um, attach the connotations of the dictator's actions to the term democracy, but we single him out for his own actions. In the same way, we should single out countries like Saudi Arabia and the Wahhabis that commit atrocities not only in Saudi Arabia, but they export them elsewhere in Africa. Boko Haram are financed by Saudi Arabia. Various terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda, Daesh, are financed by Saudi Arabia. And I think we should point this out. Thank you. So many points, but briefly I'll try uh, to, uh, as far as the interpretation, I'm, now I'm going to go in small uh, uh, sections, hopefully. Uh, I can't give lengthy answers, but uh, you spoke about the interpretation of the Holy Quran. I speak for the Ahmadiyya interpretation. There may be other vast interpretations of people. The one principle which we can keep in view, which will remove all of these differences and allow us to understand what the Quran really teaches is if the Holy Quran is taken as a text by itself, any interpretation of the Holy Quran which contradicts another verse of the Holy Quran is obviously a false interpretation. I would argue that the actions of various non-Muslim states, without naming any names, go against the very fundamental teachings of uh, the Holy Quran, and therefore I can prove why I believe a certain inter interpretation is true or false. So the main principle which I put forth is universal to all Muslims and all people. Any interpretation of a verse of the Holy Quran which contradicts another clear verse of the Holy Quran in principle is obviously false. Now, that allows us to understand whether a certain interpretation we are adhering to is correct or not. 
You mentioned the Rida Wars. Those wars, unfortunately, have been presented in history as being wars against apostasy. In the Holy Quran, there is absolutely no punishment for apostasy whatsoever. As I mentioned, the Holy Quran says, La ikraha fiddin, there is no compulsion in religion. Those wars, unfortunately, historians have taken them to understand, have understood them to be wars fought against apostates. They were not wars fought, fought against apostates. They were simple wars fought against rebels who were opposing the Muslim state, who were opposing the state present at that time. And even in any country today in Malta, in any country for that matter, if a group of rebels stood up and started to create havoc in the land, the authorities would take action. That's all they were. They were not religiously motivated wars. Of course, that's a very brief answer, but we have to leave it at that. Maybe we can talk about this at some other time. Uh, the gentleman over there mentioned uh, the, in, the, the concept of Islam being a legal uh, code and how that has a relationship. I mentioned in my speech that as far as the penal code is absolutely true, as a Muslim, I follow the Sharia. And I have not imposed that religious belief on, anywhere, on anyone else, and it is a way of life, definitely. But what I mentioned, when I said that Islam teaches a secular state and a secular philosophy on uh, governance, what that means simply is that the Holy Quran presents principles of justice and equality which are universal. They are applicable equally to all people of different faiths. And that is why the Holy Quran is a beautiful book of guidance. And when I talk about Sharia law, I don't refer to my rigid interpretation of the text and applying it universally to all people. What we believe is that the Holy Quran teaches that Sharia and state, i.e. religion and matters of citizenship are to be kept separate. Everyone has the right to believe what they, whatever they want and whoever wants to believe in the law of God, they are free to do that. Atheists are free to believe in no God and that is absolutely true. You mentioned whether these are, whether there is any practical example of this. Well, the practical example is in the life of the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him. I mentioned in my brief speech that he was a head of state who was elected in Medina by people who were not only Muslims, they were Jews and idolaters and people of all different faiths. And the Prophet of Islam practically served as a head of state and everyone had their rights. Everyone had the right to choose whatever they want to believe in. No Islamic interpretation of theology was imposed on anyone. No one was ever compelled to follow a certain teaching of Islam. And that is the beautiful concept of Sharia which we, uh, which we put forth and we believe that that, it, that that is in complete accordance with the Holy Quran. Sharia law does not mean that the interpretation of a select group of people is to be imposed universally on all people because as I mentioned, there is no compulsion in matters of religion. Definitely principles mentioned in the Holy Quran can be sought as far as benefiting society is concerned, but even in that case, as I mentioned when I was speaking to Andrew, that a certain action, a certain stern uh, or lenient action can be voted into government as far as theft is concerned, as far as other crimes are concerned. Islam does not state that a certain form of government, government must be uh, applied in the world at large. Islam simply says that people who are from different backgrounds have the right to come together and decide on a teaching which they believe through a democratic process. As long as those teachings are conducive to equality and humanity and overall well-being and freedom of conscience, then that exactly is what the Holy Quran teaches. Very briefly, forgive me please. Uh, the uh, wonderful lady at the back asked a very qu uh, a pertinent question. Uh, thank you very much for the tone in which you asked that question. Uh, uh, that, is a, uh, that is commendable for you. Uh, to put forth your question in such a loving, respectful way. I believe that God speaks, as far as revelation is concerned, He speaks to women in the same way that He speaks to men. There is no differentiation whatsoever as far as spiritual rank and relationship with God is concerned. In fact, the Holy Prophet of Islam, in the Quran, it is mentioned that women and men both have equal chance to grow closer to Allah the Almighty, to God. And God reveals himself to women just as he does to men. God is not a misogynistic God who 
singles out men and ignores women. Absolutely not. In fact, the Holy Prophet of Islam said about his wife Aisha, referring to all, he was addressing all of the Muslims, and he said that, oh Muslims, you can learn half of your faith from Aisha, my wife. And Hazrat Aisha, who was the noble wife of the Holy Prophet of Islam, after the demise of the Prophet of Islam, she used to deliver lectures. She used to address large gatherings of men as well as women. And she would teach Islam to them. She would teach them how to grow closer to Allah. And she was a very grand, uh, a, a woman of very high stature in Islam. And similarly, in Islamic history, there have been many examples of women who have not only attained a high spiritual rank and who receive revelation from God the Almighty, but who have set examples for all people. Just in the very end, I would like to mention, to clarify this notion that Islam considers women to be second-class citizens, God forbid. Do you know that in the Holy Quran, Allah the Almighty has likened all believers to Mary. Allah the Almighty says that as far as believers are concerned, whether they are men and women, there is a beautiful example in them in Mary. And Mary was a wonderful example of piety and purity and chastity. And men are taught in the Holy Quran to follow the example of Mary because she was a wonderful example of righteousness and purity and piety. So this is the rank that a man was not put forth as an example for all people as piety and as someone who is pious and righteous. God chose a woman to become the epitome of righteousness, to, to become the hallmark of righteousness. And God the Almighty put forth the example of Mary for all people from future generations to follow as far as purity and piety is concerned. So women are definitely given a wonderful status in Islam. The people who degrade women, who usurp their rights, and who claim that Islam teaches them to do so, not only do a dishonor to themselves, they do a dishonor to Islam. That's not the Islam that I believe in. And that's not the Islam that Atif believes in. The Islam that we practice and the Islam that we follow is a religion which gives equality and which gives a equal status to both men and women. And Thank you. Well, well in, in Islam, in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, women are uh, made, uh, are given uh, positions of executive authority. So all I can say is that anyone who discriminates against women, uh, that is not something which we believe in and practically our example is also contrary to that as well. In the first years of Christianity, women uh, were also priests, you know, they, they had a lot of power, but then we are at the point where we are now. Apologies for being a but... Yes, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I'd like to thank you all for joining us here today on behalf of KSU and Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Thank you for joining us. Outside, there are just a few refreshments. If you have any other questions or comments, um, feel free to approach our guests here and ask your questions. Continue your discussion. Thank you.